Welcome everybody from Bhopal, Trivandrum and Pune. So let me get started. Before we go on to the subject matter, let me introduce a little bit about the course. Uh, the course is uh, having quite a bit of packed syllabus and it has its own prerequisites. As many of you might imagine, this course is not going to be about interpretation of NMR spectra of organic and inorganic molecules. This course is more about how NMR works. So for people from ISAT Bhopal, such a course will come up in your uh, eighth semester, second part of your fourth year. I think it's called 416 and 402 probably from inorganic chemistry and from organic chemistry. So this is not an interpretative, uh, interpretive course where you will see spectra after spectra to understand, okay, which functional group is present. So if that is your thought process, this is not the right course for you. Sorry to be scaring you guys away. That is not my intention. The whole idea is to make sure that your expectations are indeed captured by the course. So that helps us get started. The prerequisite for the co this course is uh, something like quantum chemistry. This is mandatory and also mathematical methods where you, we would end up some using some concepts from math methods here. Molecular spectroscopy is desirable. As I said, similar to 402 and 416, which is organic and inorganic interpreted to spectroscopy. There's also how does spectroscopy work from physical chemistry perspective that'll come in the next semester for all of you guys. It's desirable because some of the concepts that we would need in this course, I'll anyway introduce here. So do not worry about it. Students from Pune and Trivandrum might have had exposure to these topics in variable amounts. If there are any leaps I'm making in understanding, and if you don't understand, please feel free to voice your opinion. I'll be uh, trying to give a brief introduction of the topic so that we keep everybody at bay. So I hope this sets the tone for the fact. Of course, you should know basic chemistry that carbonyl are four bonds, oxygen two bonds, and so on and so forth, right? That's a prerequisite beyond any of whatever is mentioned here. Common sense is welcome. So please try to make sure the logic and rational that you've developed in your bachelor's so far will also be employed here as we go forward. The main objectives here will be to define the fundamental concepts in NMR spectroscopy. So what is spectroscopy? What is nuclear about it? What's, what is magnetism that arises out of the nuclear spins? Is what we will start by explaining the fundamental concepts. Then we move on to classify and discuss the theoretical or origin. So basically we'll understand what is NMR spectroscopy from classical perspective to start with, because this will help us understand without any quantum mechanics basics, how does NMR and even MRI work? And then as we move on, we'll also try to understand using this background, how do NMR experiments start working? So here is where we'll start to understand something like, wait, how does a 1D NMR spectrum work? I'll give you an example of a 1D NMR spectrum in today's class as we go forward uh, for the people who may not be initiated in NMR spectroscopy. The moment we have developed this framework of classical and quantum mechanical picture, then we'll yet again understand one-dimensional NMR spectroscopy from the quantum mechanics perspective. And after that, we will end up increasing one level up and trying to understand something called multi-dimensional NMR experiments. Uh, as you guys grow more senior and with more experience in chemistry, you'll realize one-dimensional NMR and multi-dimensional NMR has revolutionized research in chemistry and biology and even in physics. So that will be the crux of this course. And it will be a lot of grind in terms of understanding the concepts from extreme fundamentals. So please make sure you take a look at the course content before you make a decision, largely because this is not a course where it's going to be walk in the park. You will have to work continuously. We'll try to give uh, problems after uh, regular intervals so that you will be able to you know, catch up with some of these ideas. I'm not saying all ideas is easy. Some of the ideas are tough to understand, which can become easier if you try to solve some problems. So if something is given to you as a homework in the class, Make sure you go back and try to work it out. If you don't work it out over a period, these things will pile up so much that after one month, you'll be like, what is going on with this course? So let me uh, put it as a word of caution to start with. If you're able to finish all these three within a reasonable amount of time, we do hope to understand how NMR spectroscopy is applied across various uh, uh, research fields. One of such is understanding biomolecular systems like proteins and nucleic acids, and the whole idea of this course is to go from theoretical concepts to application of the theoretical concepts and hopefully get your hands dirty with some, some NMR data to understand what works and what doesn't. So we are very ambitious with this course. Okay, And you would be able to see that from the syllabus that we paint here. 
So the first one to two weeks will be based on the classical picture and we'll apply it to very simple systems. I'll give examples of simple systems as we go forward. The next two weeks or three weeks is going to be a serious grind where we will take up concepts or postulates from quantum mechanics and apply it to NMR spectroscopy. It'll finally give us something called a master equation uh, called the Liouville von Neumann equation, which will help us predict outcome of NMR experiments. And from there on starts the toil of understanding, okay, now that we have created a theoretical framework, how would we end up applying it to NMR experiments that work? Hopefully we start with the 1D NMR. This itself will be a lot of learning and understanding how does 1D proton NMR work? How does 1D carbon NMR work? And we'll finish off with something, uh, an experiment that I'm super excited about. It's called the DEPT, Distortionless Enhancement by Polarization Transfer Experiment. If you understand these proton NMR, carbon 1D NMR, and DEPT NMR, you'll understand how NMR is able to achieve something extremely complicated using the theoretical background that has been developed. With that being the case, the next part that we'll be going towards is to understand a little bit of NMR instrumentation. In this aspect, uh, when this happens, I'll give you a block diagram of how NMR looks like. And we will also end up taking a tour to the NMR center to look at different components. But we are talking about a single class and hopefully even understanding how we collect data maybe within one or two classes. Then after we go to the hardware and understanding how things go, we'll try to understand 2D NMR spectroscopy in the, the basic of experiments. So the minimum I hope to achieve is to make you guys understand an experiment called HSQC, called the Heteronuclear Single Quantum Coherence Spectroscopy and HMQC, Heteronuclear Multiple Quantum Coherence Spectroscopy. These two 2D experiments forms the backbone of biomolecular uh, characterization, like proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, so, so are small molecules, by the way. And as I said, if we have the stamina, strength, scope, and the time, then we'll be going towards systems such as proteins and nucleic acids, okay? And the textbooks that we suggest to read are given here. Uh, so please make sure that you guys end up reading portions from these different textbooks. So make sure that you guys do end up catching up with the lectures. If you don't understand something, I will always start the first five to 10 minutes of the lecture asking, do you have questions from the previous class? So please ensure, uh, especially people across Pune and Trivandrum, to unmute yourself and make sure you ask questions. In order to facilitate the process of making sure we don't waste much time in technical glitches, I've also started this Google Classroom. Uh, let me go back. So the moment you get added onto this, you will have access to the stream of stuff what's going on. I just copy pasted the syllabus here yet again, and any other updates that I expect to see. For instance, I've also added the material from 2020 and 2021 that are available for you guys to watch. So please make sure to add yourself to the school classroom if you're interested further in this course to get regular updates. Next, we will be discussing about uh, quizzes and everything. So basically quiz one, Across ISAs will happen between 21 to 26 August. I'm telling this upfront because you got to keep preparing. This is the best way we can do continuous assessment. So please make a note of it. Anyway, I'll share this part of it in uh, Google Classroom today. So it's going to be available for your uh, notice. Quiz one will be 10% of the overall grading. Midsum will be 30% across overall grading. Quiz two will be 10% again. And end sum will be 50%. And this is for TVM plus Bhopal. Pune guys, please don't get distracted. Your numbers are to the left. This is based on the policies of different ISRs. So please make note of the dates. Uh, the exact date of the quiz will be announced maybe a week in advance. The evaluations will be done by respective instructors from that given ISR. So Jeet will evaluate for Pune, Vinesh for Trivandrum, and myself for Bhopal. All questions are going to be based on your understanding, not right out of textbook. So let's get started with the first question of what is spectroscopy? Spectroscopy is one where people try to characterize a given molecule or a given entity in as many different ways. So you can think of it in some ways like a molecular fingerprinting. As much as a fingerprint is unique to each person, similarly, every molecule also has its unique signatures, yeah? So there are different spectroscopic techniques that end up looking at different molecular features. For instance, if I have to characterize the people who are sitting in this course right now, what I will try to find, what is the gender, what is the height, maybe what is the hair color, what is the eye color, 
you know, what is the weight and so on and so forth. You have many attributes for a given human being on uh, what major they are doing. Are they doing chemistry? Are they doing physics? Which year of uh, class they are in and so on and so forth. If I take such amount of data for each one of you people here, then I'm pretty sure each one of you will have a unique set of record. It'll match, some part of it will match with some set of students, but all part of it will almost never match with another student. That's going to be rare. Do you guys agree on it? Let's say I add a, another layer of CPI to it, in which case it's definitely going to be more or less unique, at least the last decimal, right? So that is what is spectroscopy. So what people generally try to do is to characterize the molecules that they have synthesized or they're trying to understand by using spectroscopic techniques. So in this aspect, what is spectroscopy? Whenever you have two different energy levels, people who are already exposed to quantum mechanics know the fact that energy levels of uh, atomistic and molecular systems are quantized. So the moment you have two different energy levels, what is going to happen? Let's say I call one energy level, let's say uh, ground and excited just for the sake of it, uh, and they have an energy difference between them. What is this going to cause is that the population in the energy levels, PE and PG, are going to be different. Yeah. So people who are already taken statistical mechanics will know that it goes by something called the Boltzmann's distribution, meaning that the population in the excited or the higher energy state is going to be, with respect to the lower energy state, is going to be proportional to the, uh, what is it called? Uh, oh, I shouldn't use G. Um, Degeneracy, maybe I'll use D, although it's not a common term. Degeneracy of the ex excited state to that of the energy difference between the states that is being present. So basically, if the energy difference is high, the population difference will be high, right? But as you keep increasing G, the population in E will keep reducing. The more and more is the energy different, less and less is the excited state that is populated. This is what is called the Boltzmann's distribution. Of course, I'm leaving a normalization factor that comes in, but for all practical purposes of this NMR course, the population difference is going to be driven by the uh, energy difference between these two levels. And I'm sure you would remember from quantum mechanics that the degeneracy depends upon the model that you're looking at. For instance, the particle in a one dimension box has no levels of degeneracy. Basically, everything is singly degenerate. So is the harmonic oscillator, correct? The moment you go to a particle in a two-dimension box, depending upon the symmetry within the box, if you go for a square box, you have two-level degeneracy depending upon the quantum numbers. Let's say uh, Nm versus Mn. Basically, psi 1, 2 and psi 2, 1 will have the same energy the dimensions of the box is if it's a square box, right? So degeneracy starts to kick in there. But of course, if you start to go to a particle in a ring, right, you once again have two-level degeneracy except for the ground state. I hope you guys remember this, where you have a particle in a ring. So you have two level degeneracies that start to come for any quantum number, which is not M, where M is not equal to zero. M equal to zero is an allowed solution there. Where M is not equal to zero, you're going to have two level degeneracies. On the other hand, if you guys might remember rotational spectroscopy, or rather a particle, uh, um, a rigid rotor problem. The rigid rotor problem, what you start to learn is that the degeneracy for a given quantum number J is going to go as 2J plus one. Right? So, which is why an s orbital, I'm, I'm, I'm saying 2L plus 1, I just switched the indices here, where, where L equal to 0, you have s orbital of sigly degenerate, L equal to 1, you have triply degenerate, which is a p orbital, L equal to 2, you have uh, phi level degeneracy, which is the d orbital, and so on and so forth. So, unlike you have degeneracies in the other questions that I've been looking at, NMR spectroscopy, especially of spin 1 or even any spin, is so nice where the degeneracy for all the states is 1. So literally, the population difference that's going to go is going to be depending upon the energy difference between the states that's going to be present. Okay. So with that being the case, let me take an example. This is a very crude example to make you guys understand on what is spectroscopy. Let's say five molecules are present in the ground state and three molecules are present in the excited state. What is spectroscopy? Spectroscopy is about disturbing the system in terms of applying an electromagnetic radiation, which some of the spectroscopists call as light, you end up disturbing the system, which less change of population happens between the ground and excited state, and how the system returns back to its equilibrium when you study this is what is called spectroscopy. Okay, this is a common definition of spectroscopy across UV visible, IR, fluorescence, NMR, ESR, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I hope this sets the stage. So basically, when you have a system, 
when you have discrete energy levels that are present, there is a population difference that exists. When you probe this population difference with help of an electromagnetic radiation, that technique, and of course, you record the signal that comes out of it, is called spectroscopy. Okay, so this is what I just explained to you guys a moment earlier. Interaction of light with matter is called spectroscopy, and NMR is a type of spectroscopy. And spectroscopy gives a fingerprint for a given molecule so that if you're able to collect every possible fingerprint, and if a murder happens, and if you get end up getting a fingerprint, you will be able to say who's the culpable uh, murderer, isn't it? So that's the way, same way spectroscopy works. We cannot see the molecules from our, with our eyes because the molecules are super small, right? They are in the angstrom to nano if you're looking at materials. So you cannot see them directly. There are techniques like X-ray crystallography, which can still look at the electron distribution and picture it. But for most of the practical purposes, you cannot look at atoms directly. You cannot, as much as you're able to see me, you cannot see atoms directly. So spectroscopy is an indirect way of getting as many fingerprints of the molecule so that you'll be able to characterize which molecule is what, yeah? So with that being the case, I just said the light that we are trying to use in electromagnetic radiation, and the electromagnetic magnetic radiation spans a very wide range of wavelengths or frequencies, okay? The higher the energy, it's probing the energy levels that are farther away from one another. And in this aspect, NMR is one of the best where we end up probing only very feeble energy uh, levels, meaning that literally using signals of that strength to probe what kind of energy levels are present. I guess my internet is a little unstable. Let me wait for one moment. I hope it got better, but we'll see as we go forward. So NMR ends up the electromagnetic radiations and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy uses is uh, most, I mean, actually in the range of AM radio, not even in the range of FM radio. Okay, we actually subtract it out. AM radio actually is lower in energy than FM radio. Yeah, with that being the case, you're able to see other spectroscopic techniques such as microwave uh, uh, technique, uh, IR vibration technique, UV visible, X-rays, and so on and so forth, which have a higher and higher energy. So the reason why NMR is a wonderful technique is that it uses very low frequency radiations to probe the system. So therefore, it's a non-invasive technique. This is also the reason why many of you guys might have done MRI scans more happily in ways where it's not harmful for you, although the noise is too much. But in reality, one can actually get enough number of MRI scans done but you cannot keep on going to X-ray scans over and over again because X-ray ends up perturbing the body. If you do too many X-rays, it could be carcinogenic in its own way. So NMR is a beautiful technique which is non-invasive in nature and gives you a lot of structural detail. So let me quickly give you what's a molecular fingerprint. Whenever I'm talking about a spectrum, what I want students to imagine is a plot of intensity as a function of energy, some form of energy units. And you have something called a resonance, yeah? So you, the, people call it a resonance or a peak. Okay, in NMR, we call it a peak. And in depending upon the spectroscopy you're trying to do, you, some call it a band spectrum, line spectrum, and so on and so forth, right? So a uh, uh, spectrum is characterized by plotting intensity as a function of energy. This is one such example. NMR resonances look like this. They have a characteristic Lorentzian, Lorentzian line shape, which we will learn as we go further in course, which means that it's rather very sharp. And each such resonance is characterized by something called its resonance frequency, which is where the maximum occurs, okay? And each of this line is also characterized by something called a full width at half height or half maximum, which depends upon some characteristics of this molecule, which also we will understand as we go further and further, okay? And depending upon the intensity and the noise that comes in, so basically the spectrum that is shown here has zero noise, but this is not reality. In reality, you'll have something called noise. Depending upon the intensity and the noise that starts to come in, there is something called a signal-to-noise ratio, where when people have something like minimum three is to one signal-to-noise ratio, then they call it a resonance. Okay, any peak or resonance that's less than this, people won't take it seriously. Okay, this is to make sure we don't end up interpreting artifacts things that are not a signal as a signal, okay? So with that being the case, I'll just quickly give you some examples of different spectroscopies, okay? This is an example of sucrose molecule. All of us know sucrose, right? It's C12, H22, 
411 is. And this is an example of a proton NMR one dimensional spectrum of sucrose. And what you will be able to see if you calmly sit and count, you will actually be able to count all the 22 protons that are present in this molecule. Okay, I'm not showing the details of it, which I'm sure you can go online and be able to understand. Literally, every proton atom that you're able to see in uh, glucose, you'll be uh, sucrose, you'll be able to see it, glucose and fructose. Yeah, so that is the power at which you'll be able to see NMR in, and this is a reference standard. That's not from the sample. Now, let's take the same thing, and I hope you guys are able to understand you have intensity as a function of energy. Any questions from Bhopal? Louder? Good. The y-axis is intensity. The x-axis is energy, relative energy, but it's given a unit PPM, which we'll understand later. It's not a concentration unit. Yeah. So let me give you another example of a spectrum. This is not an NMR spectrum. This is iodopropane, a molecule I'm pretty sure you will be able to easily visualize. And you guys should have studied so much of chemistry where you know the staggered conformation is one of the most stable. This is such an example where from a spectroscopic technique, which is microwave rotation spectrum, one is able to characterize the trans and the gauge forms of iodopropane. Yet again, I'm not trying to teach rotational spectroscopy here. I want you to pick up the general feature of a spectrum where you have a resonance and intensity as a function of energy. Yeah. And if I have to give you a little bit of an idea of line weights here, you're plotting in range of kilohertz, and you're already plotting in the range of gigahertz when it comes to rotational spectroscopy. So slowly you will realize the NMR lines are of the order of one hertz. On the other hand, the microwave spectrum, the, uh, the widths are in the range of kilohertz already. Okay, this is one of the sharpest microwave spectrums that I could find. Yeah? Now, let's take the same sucrose molecule and ask how does the IR spectrum look? Okay, so instead of having an absorptive signal, this is more of rather a transmitted signal, it's more of an absorptive change in absorbance that starts to come. So you have negative peaks, but that's okay. And what you see here from rotational, uh, sorry, from vibrational NMR spectroscopy from sucrose of IR, you realize that which functional groups are present. Okay, here you will not be able to pick up uh, in, the, in the rotational spectrum, you saw conformers that existed. You couldn't get the signatures of each given atom but you are able to get an idea of the components that are present. How do you calculate it? You will learn more in CHM 422, where you learn what's a symmetric rotor, asymmetric rotor, and so on and so forth, okay? Right now, I'm not going to go into the details. Similarly, IR spectroscopy works on vibrations. If you guys remind yourself of the uh, uh, harmonic oscillator, you have energy levels that come up for every vibration. And depending upon the strength of the bond, that is the fourth constant and the reduced mass, the energy difference will be different. If they're different, they're going to have come up at different energy levels. So therefore, NH versus an OH is going to be different. OH that's hydrogen bonded versus non-hydrogen bonded is different. So that's how IR spectroscopy works. But yet again, what you're able to appreciate here is that you're plotting intensity as a form of energy. But of course, it's in wave numbers. Instead of plotting nu or lambda, they are plotting one over lambda, which is nu bar. Yeah. Sorry, uh, the thing they're plotting C or uh, lambda or something. Anyways. And similarly, the same sucrose molecule, the same vibrational spectrum, if you start doing a Raman spectroscopy, which probes in a very similar energy as IR, you actually see different set of signals because Raman works in a slightly different way from uh, IR by, uh, spectroscopy. And the important aspect of this that I want to drive to you guys is that all spectroscopies are looking at different phenomenon of the same molecule. I couldn't find rotation spectrum of sucrose. Else I would have shown sucrose across all these spectroscopies. Yeah. And what one is able to understand, okay, if you are able to characterize a given molecule across different spectroscopies, then you'll be able to uniquely say which molecule it is. Yeah, so NMR also paves the way in a similar kind. So let me give a quick example of how NMR works by taking very, very simple molecules. One of the molecules that we are trying to look at is H2O, which has a structure that looks like this. Pretty sure you guys have done group theory and symmetry. You realize that it, it belongs to the C2V point group where both the protons are identical or chemically equivalent. So NMR looks, for instance, proton NMR would look at chemically equivalent protons that are present. So here you won't get two NMR signals, you'll get a single NMR signal for water. So you basically you'll get only one resonance. So similarly, if you end up taking something like methane, which once again belongs to the tetrahedron point group, all the four protons are similar, 
you'll get a single peak. Of course, the resonance frequency for the water proton and the methane proton are going to be quite different. Let me take a better example, a molecule which many of us like, which is ethanol. So in ethanol, you have three different protons that are being present. One is a methyl proton, the other is the methylene proton, and the hydroxyl proton. So you guys are able to realize there are three chemically distinguishable protons that are present that are not equivalent to one another. You do any type of symmetry operation, you will not be able to superimpose the methylene proton to the methyl proton or vice versa or with the hydroxyl protons. So this tells you there are three unique protons that are being present. Yeah. So therefore, NMR should give you three signals out of it. Then you might always argue, hey, what happens to the three protons within the methyl group? There, they are symmetrical. I mean, they are uh, identical due to symmetry operation. Correct? If you're able to take just a methyl group, passing through the C-C bond, you'll be able to rotate this, uh, rotate and get the CHS to be equivalent to one another. So you have three equivalents of methyl proton, two equivalents of methylene proton, and one equivalent of the hydroxyl proton. Yeah? So you'll still get three signals, but within each signal, there'll be more signals within it. Basically, the methyl have equivalents of three, uh, methylene will have two, and hydroxyl will have one. Okay. We just saw an example where you get only one signal for water and methane, but their resonance frequency will be different. Why will it be different? Because the electronic environment around the proton is actually different between an OH bond versus a CH bond. As chemists, we all know the oxygen is more electronegative, so therefore the electron cloud will be drawn more towards the oxygen than in the case of carbon. Carbon and proton have very similar electronegativity numbers in the Pauling scale, so therefore they are going to equally share it, unlike the case of OH. That's why we said the resonance frequencies are going to be different. The similar effect starts to manifest here. So although you have a CH3, with this, which is an al uh, alkyl proton, CH2, which is also an alkyl proton, the CH2 is bonded to oxygen, while the CH3 is just bonded to another methylene group. So if you end up taking the NMR spectrum, you're going to get something like this, where the hydroxyl proton comes up at a certain frequency, and the methyl protons come up some other frequency, and the hydroxyl comes up separately. Okay, the reason why I drew bigger and bigger portions is because NMR is also a quantitative technique where if you end up integrating, you will have the total number of equivalent protons within the group. Since you have three of the methyl protons, the integral here will be three, two of here will be two, and if you take the right solvent, you'll also be able to integrate and get hydroxyl proton as one. If you take it, uh, take neat ethanol, you won't be able to do this, but let me assume it's ethanol in DMS or D6. Okay, for the want of time, let me stop here. So this is what is NMR spectroscopy. It gives you atom-specific information on how do protons and carbons and nitrogens and phosphorus and fluorine and sodium, blah, 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 so many different atoms look like. Okay, from the next class, we will start to understand, okay, what other features does an NMR spectrum give you and how does it help us in atomistic characterization? So with that, let me stop the lecture here and ask if there are any questions. Okay. Sir. Yes. So can we tell that two protons are equivalent uh, if and only if they are related by some symmetry operation? Yes, for most part. There are also exceptions that come here. Since it's the first lecture, I don't want to go to the definition of what is magnetic equivalence, but almost uh, you can apply that rule for about 99% of the cases. Yeah, let's put okay. it that way. There are exceptions. What I request all the students to do as an exercise for today, Please predict the NMR spectrum, just the chemical shifts for N-butane and isobutane. And see whether NMR would be able to distinguish proton NMR. Don't do anything complicated. Okay? And come back, maybe we'll start here from the next class. If I forget it, please remind me so that we can start from this question. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for your kind attention. I'll meet you guys in the next class. If there's a, like a long alkane chain, then all the hydrogens will have similar... Uh, Totally uh, correct. Environment. So, can they all be in a single peak in NMR? Not really. They will actually, yeah, they will start overlapping. They will not be resolvable. But we'll get to that as we go further. Let me, many people don't even understand the ethanol NMR spectrum I drew. But you're totally correct. Polymers suffer from whatever you're saying. Yeah? When you have a long chain alkyl group, it's not going to be easily distinguishable. Yeah? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.